So it's a pleasure to be discussing today uh, the works by uh, Paul Kmel, Pierre Raphael, um, Igor Lenkansky, and Jamie Cheftel. So I'll be talking about, uh, I guess, the reason why they got this uh, prize. So it's a, a long series of papers. I'll try to sum up a bit of it, what they've been doing in just in 20 minutes. So if you have any questions, please ask them, don't ask me. It's uh, a hard work, so I tried to understand as much as I could, and I'll try to explain to you as much as I, as much as I can as of their work, uh, which concerns uh, PDEs coming from physics. So let me just explain in a few words uh, some questions you can ask when you're given an equation coming from physics. Of course, the first question you can ask are, is, are there solutions? And then what, they do, what do they look like? How many are there? And especially, uh, is there some kind of finite time breakdown, whatever that means, okay? And if there is some kind of breakdown of what type is it? What does the solution look, look like at that time? So what they've been doing is, and so in three papers, they've been studying seemingly very different types of equations. One is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which comes from quantum physics, quantum mechanics. And the other is a, a set of two equations, the Euler or Navier-Stokes equations relating to fluids. Okay, so th those look like very different uh, physical problems, you will see the PDEs are very different, but uh, they sort of link the two to prove uh, blow-up results in all three uh, settings. Okay, so that's uh, three long papers I'll be trying to summarize uh, right now. So let me start with the Schrodinger equations. That's a well-known equation, I guess, coming from quantum physics, so you can see it up there. U is a complex-valued function, okay, depending on time and position. So time will be an R. Okay, uh, real variable position in Rd, D is the dimension of, the, of uh, your physical space, and uh, U is complex valued. So the question is the following. Give yourself an initial data, U0. Can you solve this equation? So P here is a number we'll be uh, defining later on. It's a nonlinear equation. Can you find a solution U to that equation, which is equal to U0 at time 0? And uh, for how long can you solve the equation? Okay, is, 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 is the time of existence of your solution, whatever that means, finite or not? So to answer this question, the first thing you should ask is what functional space should I look for my solution in, right? Should I take it C2 because I have two deriva derivatives in my equation? Should I take it like a distribution that might be complicated because it's nonlinear? So what should I do? How, can I, how should I choose my function space? And so here physics helps you because the equation comes from physics. So behind this equation, you have some conserved quantities, for instance. So you should try to use those conserved quantities to solve the equation. So the first uh, conserved quantity is mass. So use here, I didn't say that's a wave function of your system. The mass is actually the square of the uh, modulus of u. That's conserved in time. And here the second equation is wrong. I have a typo, d over dt should be outside. So what's conserved is the energy, the kin kinetic energy and some kind of potential energy. Okay, those things are conserved in time. So you should try to use those, that information to solve the equation. You know whatever happens, whatever you do, the L2 norm, this is the L2 norm of your solution, will never blow up, okay? And the H1 norm, H for subolith for some reason, H, uh, H1 means one derivative in L2, that will never blow up in finite time, okay? Because it's controlled. If your initial data is in that space, your solution will stay in that space forever. So you should try to use that to solve the equation. So generally, when people use that, that information, what they do is uh, you're given a PDE, you can't solve it, so you're just going to replace it by something you can solve, by some kind of approximation. So you replace, you replace your PDE by an ODE, for instance, okay, by some kind of truncation, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you, you like. You solve your ODE by some kind of Cauchy-Lipschitz theorem, and then you can have a global solution to your ODE because of the conserved quantities, because you have global bounds. Okay? So you won't exit the space in which you do your Cauchy-Lipschitz. So you have, let's say, an approximate uh, sequence of solutions to your equation, Thanks to your conserved quantities, they're bounded, so they're global. Then all you have to do is take limits in your sequence of, of approximate solutions and to build a, a solution to your original problem. Okay, but then it gets a little bit complicated because even if you're bounded, then maybe if you have a bounded sequence, you can take a limit to get a, a weak limit in the sense of distributions. But since your equation is nonlinear, getting a, uh, taking the nonlinear part and letting it converge to the nonlinear uh, limit is difficult, sometimes not possible. You need some kind of compactness. So that's one way of solving a PDE. And what's pretty certain is that by this way, you're going to construct a solution, but you probably won't have uniqueness. It's just a way of constructing a solution. No one tells you there's only one you can construct in that way. Okay, and here today we're interested in unique solutions to the equations. 
Okay, so another way of uh, solving the problem is writing down your equation a little bit differently. So it's up there. You write that as a fixed point. You look like you just replaced this PDE by this uh, formula, okay? I've just uh, sometimes used the group, the Schrodinger group here. Okay, and you're looking for a fixed point to this identity here, this, this map. Okay, and so one thing you can notice, just check that. Check that if you change your u into this u lambda here, with for any lambda, with those powers I put in red, the equation doesn't see the lambda. So the, the equation is scaling variant. And that's important for what I'm going to say later on. You have one scaling, one unique scaling for your equation. If you stick that u lambda into the equation, all lambdas disappear. Nothing has changed. The equation doesn't see the scaling. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if you want to do a fixed point, you all remember probably your Banach fixed point theorem telling you something has to be small to do a fixed point, right? What has to be small is the, this first guy, the e, where is e, i, t, Laplace and u, zero. This has to be small to do your fixed point. When is it small? Well, it's small if u0 is small in some space. Okay, and then the Schrodinger flow will stay small and everything will be great globally. Or if you manage to do your fixed point in some kind of Lebesgue space, then you see if t is small, then the, the flow here will be small as well by a Lebesgue theorem. Okay, so an LP in time norm, if t is small, then the LP in time norm is small. Okay, so I'm, what I'm telling you here is that either your initial data is small, then you're happy, you have a global solution if you can make your fixed point work. If your initial data is not small, then maybe for small time, this space in which you're trying to do your fixed point will be small, and then you have a solution, a unique solution. Now, I've said about 10 times the word small. What does small means mean? You see, if you measure your initial data in a space which is not scaling variant, then just change the lambda and you get a small norm. Okay? But if you do your fixed point in a space which is scale invariant, then you change the lambda, the norm does not, does not change. And morally, that's the only space in which you can hope to do a fixed point. If not just by cheating, just by changing lambda around, the equation doesn't see it, the norm gets small, you get a global solution. That doesn't seem very reasonable. Okay, and actually it isn't. So what you have to remember here, if you want to remember anything, is that if you want to do a fixed point in a nonlinear PDE, you should do it in a space which is scale invariant. If not, you're going to do something which is a little bit crazy. Just by changing a lambda, everything is small, you get a global solution. That's strange. So actually, it's what happened here, is here. And so you have to look for scale invariant norms. And so you just compute things, and you notice that if you take this S critical number of derivatives in L2, which you can compute by Fourier analysis, for instance, then this norm is invariant through the scaling, okay, globally in time for any time. L infinity in time with values in this space, that's invariant. That means you should do your, your fixed point in this space here. You should take your initial data in this space, and then your theorem will say, for small data in that space, you probably have a global solution, large data maybe for a short time, if you can, if you can do the math, of course. Okay? But that's the general idea when you have nonlinear PDE. Right, so what's important here is to see that, on the one hand, I had this energy conservation, which was one derivative in L2, never blows up. And now I'm telling you, you should do your fixed point in this space here, which is not exactly the same as one derivative, is that number of derivatives. You see, if P is very, very large, the larger the P, the larger the SC. Okay. Right, so I had the energy that's conserved. I had this critical symbolic norm. We've all forgotten what it is. It's written up there. We don't really care. But now you want to do your fixed point. What happens? The very nice case is when P is small enough, in some sense, or D is small enough, and the critical symbolic embedding, uh, symbolic exp exponent is smaller than one, then you're in very, very good shape. Because if you do a fixed point, Essentially, your fixed point breaks down when you exit the space in which you're doing your fixed point. Okay, as long as you stay in it, you can go on and on and on. So what happens is that as soon as your solution exits the, this, the, this function space, if the norm becomes infinite, then the solution, the equation breaks down. Now, if my critical norm is below one, okay, remember H1 is controlled for all times. So I'll never exit that space because I have this H1 norm telling me I'm bounded for all times. Okay, so it's not hard actually to prove that if your equation is, uh, we call that a subcritical equation, the, the scale invariant norm is smaller strictly than the energy, then you have a global solution. It's not too hard. What gets very difficult is when your critical norm is equal to one. Okay, because you have this control of the H1 norm forever, 
But, okay, this is a bit technical, I can't ex really explain why, but this H1 norm is not enough to control the fixed point because of the scale invariance. You could have concentration, concentration of energy, keep the energy bounded, but concentrations which would make you exit the fixed point space, although the H1 norm uh, stays bounded. Small data is fine. If your initial data is fine, you have global solution because everything stays small. But as soon as, as your data is large, it gets very difficult to solve a critical equation. Okay, so I'm, I'm telling you, you just have to be, believe me on that, right? You can try, but you'll see it's very difficult. So there have been a lot of works in that setting, okay, where gradually in time, people first looked at spherical, uh, spherically symmetric uh, initial data and solutions, and then gradually people were, were able to prove that there is a global solution to that equation at the critical norm. That was already a very difficult uh, problem. <coughs> now, what we're talking about today is the sub super critical case, meaning your critical norm is way higher than H1. So everyone knows now that the H1 norm is bounded for all times, but we want to do, we want to control H2, H3, whatever, something much larger than one. Okay, and the equation is not telling you that this norm is bounded in time. Okay, and so how do you solve the equation? So actually in 2000, Bourguin conjectured that there are global solutions actually, whatever the initial data in that space. Okay, global and unique solutions. But uh, it looks like if you looked at toy models, you look at numerics, people went in sort of both ways. You could imagine blow up or not, it depend on the model, and the toy model depend on the numerics. So it wasn't so clear whether this conjecture was true or not. And uh, what uh, Franck, uh, Pierre, Igor and Jérémy proved is that actually there is blow up in finite time. Everything blows up, all norms blow up, uh, uh, especially the L infinity norm blows up. So you don't have to read the statement uh, very precisely, but essentially, essentially what they say is that you can have a whole family of blow-up rates. So uh, those RKs are uh, sequences going to some critical uh, blow-up rate. And you have a finite codimensional manifold of smooth spherically symmet symmetric initial data giving you a blow-up sol solution. Okay, and actually, uh, so you can really describe very precisely the, the pro blow-up profile. It's, it's a... a it's, um, spherically symmetric, it blows up at the center of symmetry, and it actually oscillates very much near the center of symmetry. It's sort of a universal profile, so it's a very, very nice result. And uh, surprisingly, actually to prove that result, they resorted to a very deep analysis of fluid mechanics equations, like the Euler and Navier-Stokes, especially the Euler, compressible Euler equations. Okay, so what I'll do right now is forget about uh, Schrodinger. Okay, so just remember you have blow up for Schrodinger thanks to the theorem, but to prove the theorem, we're going to move to a different class of equations, which are fluid mechanics equations. So again, forget about Schrodinger, and I look at a fluid. How can I describe the movement in time, the evolution in time of a compressible fluid? Well, I'm going to call rho its density. It depends on time and space, time where I'm measuring it, at the time I'm measuring it, and the, sp and the place I'm measuring it, and the velocity of my fluid, which I'll call v here. Okay, so u is Schrodinger, v is the velocity of a fluid, it's a vector field, so it has three components, for instance, in dimension three, or d in dimension d. And here is a system of equations uh, these, um, this couple satisfies. So the first equation is the mass conservation. Essentially, you're saying that um, uh, the density is just pushed by the velocity in some sense. It's a trans sort of transport equation in some sense. And the second equation, which looks very complicated here, is the momentum conservation. It's like the Newton's laws, okay? So you have some kind of acceleration, time derivative of the velocity, nonlinear term, veloc the particles are pushed by their own velocity in some sense, and then forces, pressure forces, and viscous forces. The Euler equation com corresponds to no viscosity on the right-hand side, mu is equal to mu prime is equal to zero, and Navier-Stokes is uh, mu and mu prime fixed. Okay, and the pressure is actually a, a, a function of the density, it's given so you have this parameter gamma, I won't be really talking about it, but it's important in the, in the scaling. Okay, so you don't have to remember this, of course, but this is a system of equations, and you can ask the same questions. I give myself an initial data, can I solve those equations? Is, are the solutions global or are they local? So uh, just to gain a bit of time, I won't talk about conservations here, I won't talk about weak solutions at all, and let's just immediately turn to strong solutions, meaning a fixed point kind of solutions. And for that, remember, we have to talk about scaling. <coughs> now, in the case of the Navier-Stokes equations, there's a unique scale uh, invariance, which is given by this formula. You don't really care about the formula itself, but you have a formula. Okay, and have this parameter gamma coming in here. As for Navier-Stokes, 
For Euler, there's no right-hand side, remember, it's zero, so you have a lot more freedom, actually, and you can take any parameter r here, and it's scale invariant. So Euler has a, an infinite um, number of scale invariances, that is, host has one. Okay, so now uh, let's look at a 3D case, and so you can prove, just like for uh, NLS, Schrodinger, that for a short time you have a solution for smooth initial data. Okay, and ag again, the time of existence will be finite if your solution exits some kind of some function space, some HS space. Okay, if the HS space becomes plus infinity at some time, then you have a blow up. Okay, and so the question is, is there a blow up in finite time for a compressible Euler or an idea six? So it turns out the compressible Euler equations uh, look like a hyperbolic uh, equation in some sense, and so you can it's well known that there are shocks. So if you remember uh, the Burger's equation, for instance, this is a kind of toy model for Euler. I've killed every term except for the two first with velocity, so it's really not Euler at all. But then this equation you can solve, and you might know that since uh, the velocity is constant on characteristics, if characteristics cross, then you have blow up. What blows up? Actually, not the supernorm. The supernorm of the velocity is perfectly fine, but it's derivatives that blow up. That's what we call a shock. So it's been known that for uh, Euler you have shocks, and you also have profiles which look, look a lot like the blow-up profiles of Schrodinger, right? So these profiles are spherically symmetric, they're self-similar, and they've been known to hold for a long time, like from the 50s, uh, in physics books in particular. And so that these were known to, to hold for the Euler equations, that's a blow-up at time t, obviously, so, uh, um, spherically symmetric, but the profiles were not known to be smooth and for reasons that uh, I won't have really time to explain. It's important for the, for the rest of the talk for those profiles to be smooth. We need to work to do something. But before doing that, let me state the theorem that they proved. So it concerns Euler and Navier-Stokes. Again, for Euler, things were, were known. Some kinds of profiles, uh, blow-up profiles or blow-up situations were known. For Navier-Stokes, it's totally new. And so what I tell you is essentially the same thing as for NLS. Uh, you have a, a family of, of rates of blow up, okay, and you have a finite dimension set of initial data such that for those initial data you have blow up in finite time of the L infinity norm. It's not a shock, right? Everything blows up at the blow up time. And to prove this result, what they really use are those profiles I showed you before, and one of the main results giving those two uh, blow-up results is this, the following one, that actually you can cook up uh, self-similar solutions to the Euler equation, just as I told you before, we saw those before, but with C infinity at time zero, uh, profiles R and V. That's very important, as I'll try to explain uh, at the end. Okay, so to prove that, that's a very hard part, or there's three papers, right? That's one of them is proving this theorem. Each paper is about 100 pages long. So the thing is, you have self-similar profiles, right? So you can say, let me call Z the argument of R and V. I stick that into the equation. Since it's self-similar, all the T's will go away from my equation, and I get this system of ODEs. Okay, that's standard. And then you just look at the system of ODEs, and you wonder if you can solve it. And then you have this some kind of transform I won't detail here, which gives you this beautiful uh, um, uh, face por portrait, which is here, which they analyze fully, which I won't do, but it's uh, a beautiful piece of analysis, I find, which tells you that you can construct a solution to this uh, system of ODs, which is C infinity. That's a very, very hard part. I'd, I Time is running, so I won't explain this at all, but um, okay, the constructing those, those solutions is a very, very nice piece of analysis, which they managed to do, and uh, which I won't explain. I'm sorry, but you can look at this picture, it's really, very, very nice. Okay, so now, now you're given those profiles, they're C infinity. You know they, so you have those self-similar solutions that blow up at some time t, they're spherically symmetric, and you want to guess that those guys are probably the way our solutions for Euler or for Navier-Stokes are going to blow up. So what you do is just say, well, I'm looking for my solution as those guys plus a narrow term. Okay, I stick that into the equation. So the first thing you have to understand is how those uh, blow up profiles uh, how linearly stable they are, because you're going to linearize your equation again uh, around those guys. And you need the solution, those guys to be infinity to understand that. And then, of course, my equation is nonlinear, so I also have to understand how they're stable nonlinearly. 
And I also had to understand what the viscous terms do. And actually, strangely enough, uh, for me at least, uh, the viscosity is almost like a perturbation uh, in, the, in the problems. You hardly see it at all. So that's why they, they're able to do it at the same time Euler and, and Nagy Stokes. Okay, so that's what's written here. Written here. So again, you, you cook up your blow up profiles, you guess they're the good candidates to the solution, and then 100 pages later, you've managed to prove that you have those stability results and you have your Euler and Navier Stokes theorems. Right, so you're happy with that, but you want to understand NLS, Schrodinger. And I'll just finish with that. It turns out that if you look at your solution u to the Schrodinger equation and you write it down as uh, rho exponential i phi, it turns out that rho and gradient phi satisfy almost the compressible Euler equations. Okay, so that was known for a long time, so it was a uh, transform uh, transformation due to Madelung, as far as I know. And so you see, if you take the gradients of this equation here, it really looks very much like the compressible Euler equations. Not exactly, but uh, very much like it. So if you know Euler blows up, you can hope this guy also blows up. And 100 pages later, it does. Okay, so just to finish now, I think it's time to stop. So you have here new blow up uh, mechanisms, one for Schrodinger, which was totally uh, unknown, or the conjecture of Bourguin uh, actually said it shouldn't blow up. You get a very precise um, um, description of the solution at low up time, which is essentially universal. Uh, everything is spherically symmetric and uh, okay, very explicit. Um, and in the case of the compressible fluid mechanics, again, for Euler, there were mechanisms that were known for a long time. So it's not totally new, although the, the precise structure is new. And this infinity structure, which is very important for the rest, is totally new. And especially for Nagy Stokes, that's the first result, to my knowledge, of, uh, of blow up for the compressible Nagy Stokes equations. Right, so those are very impressive results. And um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.